Welcome to this Pearl of Laboratory Medicine brought to you by AACC and the Clinical Chemistry Trainee Council. View this and many more pearls as well as other free educational material at traineecouncil.org. Hello, my name is Ryan Metcalf. I am an Assistant Professor of Pathology at the University of Utah and Associate Medical Director of Transfusion Services at ARUP Laboratories. Welcome to this Pearl of Laboratory Medicine on Patient Blood Management. Patient blood management, or PBM, can be defined as rationally optimizing anemia and hemostasis in patients with the goal of restricting or really optimizing blood component use. Why should we care about PBM? Well, blood transfusion is by far the most commonly performed procedure in the United States, and it has been identified as one of the top five most overused procedures. PBM is now considered standard of care because it improves quality while reducing costs. It improves both the numerator and the denominator of the value equation in healthcare, which you can see is value equals quality divided by cost. There has been significant decline in red blood cell or RBC transfusions in the United States over the past several years. For example, the number of RBCs transfused from 2008 to 2015 decreased by nearly 25%, which amounts to 4 million fewer units transfused. This reduction is likely due to the implementation of PBM programs, including evidence-based guidelines for transfusion. Several large randomized controlled trials support what we call a restrictive transfusion strategy, which involves a lower hemoglobin threshold for transfusion when compared to a liberal strategy. What might a PBM program encompass? Many different types of individuals order and administer blood in a hospital. So it should ideally include a program to educate those making transfusion decisions, as well as those administering blood components. The program should develop strategies to optimize blood component use, diagnose and treat perioperative anemia, and reduce blood loss from surgery and from lab draws as an institution. This can all be implemented with effective project management. One of the major challenges to developing an effective PBM program is that blood transfusion is ordered by a variety of specialties and administered by a variety of staff. This table provides a summary of the major RBC transfusion trials comparing hemoglobin thresholds in different patient populations from critical care to upper gastrointestinal bleeding to cardiac surgery. The primary outcome of each study showed either no difference or improved outcomes in the restrictive group compared with the liberal group. If there is no evidence of benefit if patients are transfused liberally instead of restrictively, then a restrictive strategy should be used. This restrictive strategy is often a hemoglobin threshold of seven grams per deciliter, but also depends on the patient population, as you can see here, along with the individual patient's clinical picture. It is worth mentioning that a hemoglobin threshold of 7.5 grams per deciliter is supported for cardiac surgery patients intraoperatively and in the postoperative period. There is a notable lack of evidence in the setting of acute coronary ischemia and myocardial infarction. That said, we ultimately treat patients rather than laboratory values. The true indications for RBC transfusion are significant acute hemorrhage and significant signs or symptoms of anemia. However, lab values such as hemoglobin are very useful pieces of information in conjunction with the clinical picture that can help us decide whether to transfuse a patient or not. There are tried and true strategies to reduce unnecessary transfusions. Clinical decision support in the form of best practice alerts or pop-ups at computerized provider order entry has been shown to improve RBC usage. RBC transfusion interventions also reduce the proportion of patients transfused. And initiatives that reduce RBC transfusions also reduce healthcare costs. The cost to buy a unit of RBCs is somewhere around $200, while the cost of all activities that go into transfusing a unit of RBCs, such as testing and administering of the blood, is about four times greater. So, these projects can improve patient outcomes while reducing some of the unnecessary costs of our relatively expensive healthcare system. In addition to RBCs, there are three other major types of blood components in the transfusion service, platelets, plasma, and cryoprecipitate. The indication for prophylactic platelet transfusion is generally considered to be a platelet count below five to 10,000. There is little evidence 
for the ideal thresholds for platelet transfusion prior to invasive procedures or in the setting of hemorrhage. Plasma transfusion is indicated for massive hemorrhage, disseminated intravascular coagulation, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, or replacement of a factor for which a more targeted therapy is not available. And finally, cryoprecipitate is used to control bleeding associated with fibrinogen deficiency. Note that fibrinogen is critical for achieving hemostasis in hemorrhaging patients since it is both the precursor to fibrin and it facilitates platelet aggregation. The education piece of a PBM program might include electronic learning modules and in-person sessions such as grand rounds where indications, risks, and evidence surrounding blood transfusions is discussed. It is recommended that centers develop evidence-based hospital guidelines for transfusions and protocols for specific clinical situations, such as a massive transfusion protocol, where relatively large amounts of blood products are rapidly issued to massively hemorrhaging patients in a standardized fashion. Blood transfusion is a useful therapy in certain clinical circumstances, but I want to emphasize the importance of treating the underlying cause of anemia. For example, preoperative anemia is common and is associated with adverse outcomes. For elective surgeries with expected major blood loss, screening for anemia and, if present, identifying its underlying cause should be performed three to four weeks prior if possible. This allows time for treatment, for example, with iron for iron deficiency anemia and hemoglobin improvement before surgery. Acute normovolemic hemodilution, or ANH, involves the isovolemic removal of whole blood from a patient at the beginning of a major surgery and volume replacement with saline. As surgery progresses and the patient reaches a threshold requiring a transfusion, the autologous whole blood is reinfused first. If used in the appropriate setting, it may reduce allogeneic transfusion requirements by about one unit or so on average. And of course, avoiding unnecessary transfusion after surgery is important just like any other situation. Optimizing coagulopathy is important in the bleeding patient or in patients at risk of significant bleeding. Preoperative protocols for patients on anticoagulants or antiplatelet drugs can be used. In bleeding patients, normothermia and avoidance of acidosis can help achieve hemostasis. The patient can be monitored clinically as well as using laboratory values such as viscoelastic testing, hemoglobin, platelet count, and coagulation studies including fibrinogen. Protocols for administration of blood components, use of factor concentrates such as prothrombin complex concentrates, and antifibrinolytic agents can be used as well. Antifibrinolytics can reduce transfusion requirements in many clinical settings. Finally, bleeding patients with uremic platelet dysfunction can be given didioxyarginine vasopressin, or DDAVP, to release endogenous von Willebrand factor and improve platelet adhesion. To appropriately conserve the patient's own blood, reduce phlebotomy tube size, and avoid unnecessary draws and testing that will not impact management. I am not a surgeon but it makes intuitive sense to me that close attention to blood loss by using meticulous surgical technique would facilitate blood conservation. Minimally invasive surgical techniques can also help. Finally, cell salvage is used in many major blood loss surgical settings to recycle and reinfuse the patient's own shed red blood cells. We aim to optimize blood utilization and try to use patient-centered decision-making as much as possible. Informed consent involves explaining risks, benefits, and alternatives to blood transfusion. Transfusion thresholds for a given patient can be defined based on their risk profile. Other important approaches include a single unit transfusion policy for most hemodynamically stable patients in the hospital, an intelligent electronic ordering system using clinical decision support, the ability to identify the ordering physician, indication lists for guidelines, and documentation of the reason for transfusion of each component. There are several examples of how one can use data to evaluate the performance of the PBM program. One can track anemia in different settings and appropriate use of antifibrinolytics and cell salvage. Blood usage by department, by procedure, and by physician can be used for benchmarking. For example, in the table to the right, Dr. Jones uses more blood and appears to be an outlier compared to the peer group. 
Other important metrics involve the blood supply operation, such as the cross-match to transfusion ratio, which is ideally less than or equal to 1.7, the issue to transfusion ratio, and the amount of wasted blood products along with the reason. These strategies and metrics have been used successfully by PBM programs. Blood is a precious resource and should be used thoughtfully and efficiently. Our ultimate goal is to give the right product to the right patient at the right time for the right reason. It is also paramount to include patient outcomes when evaluating your PBM program. As you can see here, these can be broad or more specific to blood transfusion. All these data can be reported to clinicians as well as hospital administration. Additional data regarding cost savings and return on investment can also be included. Taken together, a data-driven approach to PBM can help you evaluate your program and identify areas for improvement on a continuous basis. Thank you for joining me on this Pearl of Laboratory Medicine on Patient Blood Management. For more like this, as well as articles, podcasts, and more, please visit the Trainee Council at traineecouncil.org.